Welcome to the Insomnia Project, the holiday episodes. This is Marco Timpano, and I'm being joined by the Sugar Plum herself. <laughs> That's me, the fairy of all sugar plums, Amanda Parker. Amanda, I know this particular tune is near and dear to your heart. I can feel the fouettes coming on. I can feel the frappes, those little staccato movements in my toe shoes as I listen to it. I have a great, great love and nostalgia for the Nutcracker. And tell us about the Nutcracker for anyone who's not aware of why it's such a Christmas or holiday holiday um, thing to see, I guess. Oh, okay. I, see, I never know. Just so listeners know, I have no idea what will well, we don't plan these things ahead of time, so I made lunch, and you said, meet me down in the studio in 10, so here I am, so the Nutcracker. If it, if you need a second, no, I can I talk about something I else. Don't need a Amanda worked at the why, ballet. why I needed to have that caveat sure. in there, that this is, none of this is planned, but, um, okay, I love the Nutcracker. I can tell you why I love it, Sure. and I think at least some of that attraction, uh, is why it's so popular. It's a ballet, first of all, we should say, right? It's a ballet. The music was written by Tchaikovsky. I was so obsessed with it when I was like ages 8 to about 12 um, that I did a whole report on Tchaikovsky in my school. I see. Um, so uh, the reason I loved it was because when you're a little girl who dances in any kind of ballet, the Nutcracker, the role, the lead role in the Nutcracker is like the penultimate role, I believe. For me, it was, you know, you don't, I didn't really dream of being the Black Swan or, um, you know, Odin or um, Cinderella or whatever the other ballets are out there because those were all grown up women. And, And often sometimes, well, not often anymore, but sometimes the lead in, in the Nutcracker is as well. But um, there are a few versions of the Nutcracker that live out there, so everyone has kind of their own version of what happens. I see. None of the versions will ever really make sense. Some some versions try to make it make sense. Because it's a dream, right? Well, in some versions it is. And in it's my some, version it's a dream. I mean, ultimately, remember, it was the music was written and the ballet was written in the 1800s, and it was meant to be a ballet, so it wasn't as in you know, kids like some little literal interpretations, and it becomes a very literally interpreted ballet. But anyway, the the kind of overall things that are usually true when you go to see the Nutcracker or watch it on TV or listen to the the music and the whole music, not just the Nutcracker Suite, which is a, a glimpse of what we just heard, right? Well, the Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy is the name of that song. I see, and that is in the Nutcracker Suite. There okay. are certain ones, but. True lovers like me know the whole score okay. and can sing it. Um, Wait, there's there's lyrics to it? No, oh, I can okay. just... Oh, you can sing the tune. Yeah. Okay. I won't do that, okay. but I can. Um, anyway, memories of listening in July on my Walkman. Like, that's how obsessed I was. Anyway, I the ballet usually has some sort of plot. Like, do you want me to go into the plot? If you can do it briefly. I can't do anything briefly. Okay, fair. There's a bear. No, no, a sugar no, plum. no, no, no. There's no. not a bear? Well, some versions have a bear, but okay. basically, because you, you know the Toronto version, and the Toronto is a very, very Russian interpretation. I don't know why. I know the Moscow version, not the Toronto version, and there's a bear in that You know version. the Toronto version. I know. Version the... Because I used to do the story time ahead of the Nutcracker. I'm telling you, I, I'm obsessed. I did it for years. So the Toronto version is a very Russian, so it's about um, Marie and Misha. But most Nutcrackers follow a German interpretation, or at least the ones I grew up with, which are Clara and Fritz. But some do have her as Mary as well, so it just depends. But anyway, that role, I know it mostly as Clara. I see, I see. Clara's parents are um, having a big Christmas party. A shindig, if you will. A shindig. In Hamburg for some, in Moscow for others. And uh, so she's very, so it starts with the kids trying to peep through the keyhole to see the party. I used to do that as a kid when my parents would have parties. I'd sneak down and look, you know, from the stairs and see what was going on. Um, so we, um, so the kids are looking through the peephole and then there's this big 
entrance, like a big um, reveal. And here you are, and it's a beautiful Christmas ballroom with a huge Christmas tree, and the kids are dancing around, and they all get presents, and there's like a dance of the family and dance of the kids, and the kids get presents. And so in most versions, there's a part where the little brother, Fritz or Misha, um, that Clara gets the nutcracker. That's what she gets as her Christmas gift. She wants a nutcracker. That's her desired gift. I don't think she. I don't think we get into what their motivations are. I think she is gifted a nutcracker. Can I just say nobody wants a nutcracker as well, a gift? Well, maybe if you're a child in Germany in the 1800s, you did. Like, did you see the dolls back then? They. I guess. They all look I mean, nutcrackers. I, I'm not a big fan of nutcrackers. They kind of scare me. They're kind of weird looking. They're soldiers. Well, they got Claire's those teeth. Well, Claire's into it. She's into this Clara, nutcracker. Clara, what's it going on? It cracks nuts. You put it in your mouth and it cracks nuts. I guess. But her and Fritz fight over it, and or he puts a really huge nut in the mu- nutcracker's mouth. Anyway, he breaks the nutcracker. As little, oh, I didn't bro- know that. Yeah, as little brothers often do, he breaks the nutcracker. Right. She's very upset. Somebody or she takes a sash and tries to like tie it back together so that it can be fixed, but she's upset that it's broken. So sure. she's sort of mothering it. And then at night, everyone... I had cousins who used to break my gifts when I would right? get them like toys yeah, and stuff. So exactly. I can relate to Clara or Marie. Yeah. So there's lots of dances in the ballroom, lots of opportunity for lots of music and types of things. Anyway, everybody goes to the guests go home. Clara, Fritz, and the parents go to bed, but Clara sneaks downstairs in her nightgown. And she looks uh, under the tree because she wants to go peek at her gift, the nutcracker, because it's all alone and broken under the tree. And as she is looking at it, suddenly the whole ballroom starts to change and the walls move away and the tree grows and grows and grows. And suddenly she's transformed into this scene, this winter scene. Is this the when their bear comes in? I think in... Some, it might be okay. when the bear comes in. But basically, the Nutcracker isn't alone. All of Fritz's toy soldiers come to life. And the Nutcracker is like the head general of them. And suddenly, there's a battle with all the mice. Oh, that, my God. That's that, what this is about? I never knew what this story you know was this? about. I'm not loving it. Okay. So, anyway, I guess you never came to watch me when I No, I didn't. Because did uh, ballet's not my thing. Yeah, it's a story, though. Anyway, so I guess, you know, you work with what you get. And kids back in the 1800s had toy soldiers, but there's probably also some mice scurrying around. And now in some version, they're rats. So you'll hear rat king or mouse king. But there's a king of all the mice or king of all the rats. I always knew it as mouse king. Now it's starting to sound like a Stephen King book. Well, it kind of goes there. So then they fight. So there's a big fight. Stephen King Christmas. Okay, there's no. a fight. All right. The Nutcracker and the Mouse King fight. The Toy Soldiers and the Mice fight. If there's bears, it's probably because there was a teddy bear. and Like, any kid's toys come to life. I see, I see. So different... I like the bear version, I have to different say. Different ballets interpret this differently. Here's my thing. Sometimes things like this don't translate over time, or don't... They... They lose their... Like the updated version would be like the kid's Nintendo Switch comes to life or I something. Guess. I don't know. I'm anyway. not, even even a Christmas Carol to me is too antiquated. I love, I love a Christmas Carol. Do you? Car- yeah, I do. <sighs> Come on. Anyway, no. let me finish the okay. Nutcracker so it's so not, so no questions are left unanswered. You know what the Christmas <laughs> Carol could use? More. Christmas Carol could use a few bears is how I feel. Yeah. Okay. okay. Maybe in some versions there are bears. Anyway. The toys come to life. There's a big battle amongst the toys and the mice, and the Nutcracker is down for the count. And at the last minute, Clara, in my version that I always knew, takes off her ballet slipper, takes off her slipper, which is a ballet slipper because she's dancing, and whaps the Mouse King on the head with it and hurts the Mouse King and and basically is the hero. I like that version because she's like the one who wins the battle. I see. But anyway, there's various versions. So then finally the mice go away. The mice, king, the mouse king has a big dramatic tongue out, crossed eyes kind of death on stage. And then the nutcracker rewards her by... Cracking a nut? No. Killing a bear? No. Taking her away to be her, his princess in, uh, in the kingdom of nutcracker, or actually the kingdom of sugar plum. And so usually... On most interpretations. I hope this is where it gets good. 
Well, they they go through a long journey in the snow, and then a bunch of snowflakes come and start dancing around them and come to life. And in some versions, when you're trying to give people solos, there's a, there's a snow fairy that comes who's like the leader of the snowflakes. What does the sugar plum fairy actually do? Because we're we haven't... not there Still? yet. No, this we're goes in snow land. We're getting, oh my we're making our way. It's the journey. So anyway, the snow okay. dances around her, and usually there's a snow machine on stage or something like that. So then off they go. Finally, act two. They enter the land. This or act two. Well, sometimes it's act one. Sometimes they just do it all the way through. Okay. Snow. The snow is like the transition. Okay. The segue. They get to the land of sugar plum. Clara. Th- Clara doesn't have much to do after this. She and the Nutcracker sit on their throne, and all the the delicious candies come to life. Okay. They're not always candies in every interpretation, but let's see if I remember them. But they're characterized by the countries that people were into in the 1800s. Okay. So there's definitely Russians. So Russian candy, I guess. Okay. There's the sugar plums, which is either can be it, the kingdom sometimes is reigned by the sugar plum fairy. Okay. Sometimes there isn't even a sugar plum fairy. Sometimes there's just sugar plums with a mother goose figure that oh comes my out. Oh, God. Like a mother goose with a big skirt and all the kids come out of her skirt. So there's lots of different versions of that. Uh, Let me think. There's an Arabian dance. I dance that as well. Okay. So. It sounds, it just keeps getting inappropriate, it sounds. I mean, it's 1800s. Okay. It's like the Epcot World Pavilion of the 1800s. Okay. There are Chinese dancers. Okay. That represents kind of all of Asia, I guess, in the 1800s. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's any more. There's usually jesters of some kind, just okay. some clowns. Maybe that's Italy. I don't know. So those are... Hey, what's that supposed to no, be? No, because Commedia dell'arte oh, okay. was big in that time, like Pantalone and Buffon. All right. So. Anyway, so um, all these different characters. And those are that's really the fun music that people often associate right. because they're short, quick pieces. Sure. So they can even be... In, like in Christmas carols, you'll hear them, those short, quick dances. Sugar right, Plum right. Fairy being one of them. And then it kind of deviates. Oh Sometimes in some versions, in Balanchine's version. Um, oh, I, I, t- I forgot about a major character. We're too late. Oh, no. We're too late. Just mention the character. Her uncle. Great. Uncle okay. Drosselmeyer. Okay, great. So Drosselmeyer. No, we don't need to hear No, but I just backstory. need to say this. I just need to oh, say this. Oh, my goodness. Drosselmeyer is the one who gives her the nutcracker. And he's like a weird, mysterious uncle. This is terrible. This is a terrible it story. It gets worse. If oh you watch God. Balanchine's version from the 70s, People are which I did. relax. Well, okay. Gelsey Kirkland and a, wonderf- a wonderful... Who would be played t- by Kelsey Grammer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dances and has to choose between toss salad or scrambled eggs. No, that's a, that's that's a, a Frasier. Okay. Yes, I, I get it. Okay, I just got a big eye roll. Listen, Drosselmeyer's really big. I forget what he's called in the Russian version, but okay. anyway... And uh, in that version, she has to choose between Drosselmeyer and the prince. So she's like dancing between them. It's what do you mean? She chooses her the... her attention. I don't know. Does one of them <laughs> need an ill fate? Like, oh, no. How is this? Just a, like, I think it's like she has to. So show. some of them are like she has to choose between staying in the land of sugar plum or going back. Okay. I guess that's what he represents. We'll go with that. Others, he doesn't have anything to do. He's just a little quirky character that comes in at the beginning, and that's it. That's who I end up playing, but anyways. Totally. So then, he's a fun one. So then, uh, anyway, there's lots of dances at the end after all the, like, candies dance. And most of them, she just is like, I'm going to live here forever. And they ride on it. What happened to her brother? Doesn't she have a brother in this? He doesn't. No. That's it? No. This is her dream, not his. In many, she wakes up at the end, and it was all a dream. Great. Is that how? There you go. That's the nutcracker, basically. Oh, my goodness. Well, now now does it all make sense? I wish I never picked that music to start the show with. I didn't realize. You asked me about the nutcracker. Don't nutcracker me if you don't. I didn't realize it was going to be this deep dive into, like, every moment of the nutcracker. I didn't know how much you loved it. You didn't know, really? I knew you liked it, but I didn't think you knew every little... Because when you're 10, you, you, the the role is Clara, that role that you really want as a kid if you're me. And I so, see. So I would... And I loved watching different versions. That was the other thing. I loved watching this version is... Anyway, I see. Whatever. Something to All see. the different variations. So I became a little bit of a nutcracker, a file, if okay. you will. Okay, yes. Okay. So if you have any nutcracker questions... <laughs> 
feel free to ask Amanda. And yet I don't own a nutcracker. And why is that? Because that would take up too much room in our Christmas cabinet. It's true. We it's do true. not have room for nutcrackers. They, if it was a projection of a nutcracker on, in front of our house, which actually I'd be very into, uh, then I would do it. But do you like nutcrackers? I like the nutcracker and what it okay. meant to me as a child. In fact, I would... I would like try to sneak downstairs on Christmas Eve just so I could have like Clara's experience. Like I was really into it. Oh wow. It was a thing. Speaking of <laughs> experiences, we've gotten some responses oh. from our uh holiday episodes oh, thus gosh. far. I'm alive. I can't imagine what they'll be from this one. No, people uh, I don't know. I think it goes downhill <laughs> from here. People are like, I like the beginning. I liked of it. it and then she got into that weird you know, Drosselmeyer situation. Uh, your uh, an episode from four years ago with your dad. Oh my gosh. So that was an awesome one. It was still, a great oh, story about yeah. um, uh, the guy who wrote chestnuts ro- roasting on open fire. The Christmas. Song. Oh yeah, I love that story. Uh, Mel Torme. Yeah, it's a great story. Yeah. So one of our listeners, Lisa Cole, needs to know what the naughty Christmas card was that we were <gasps> talking about. But I don't think it was a naughty Christmas card. There was the one of, yeah. of Santa with on the on the chimney. Using it as a toilet, which I know I didn't like. Was there a dirty That was card? never me. No, but I think we received that one time. Yeah. God. Okay. So the two that came in the pack of – I think this is what she's referring to. The right. two that came in the pack of Christmas cards where I liked the other one, like the snake with the candy cane and so on. Right. People who are listening for the first time are like, right. what's, what's happening? What's going on here? Anyway, um, there was one of a kid picking his nose. Right. This is really not a restful episode, is it? There was one of a kid picking his nose, and it's like, I don't know what it says inside. Pick yourself a good Christmas. Right. I don't. Pick I, a good I one. picked this one for you is what it says. Oh, it inside. does. Yeah. And there's some, and, and we never got these cards because they're naughty, and I don't like them. It's when they make suggestive or anatomically correct um, snow people, and it's kind of... Oh, too sexy for me. Have you ever never. seen those cards? No. Yeah, I don't like it. Okay. There it's was not... a, And then the other bad one is a baby. It's not so bad. It's like a baby in its diaper, and it's like, I made you some Christmas fudge. Oh, I just hate that card. I'm a baby that pooped it's, my diaper. I don't like it. Look at me. I don't I'm hilarious. don't like these cards. Like, who opens that card and, and, la- and then, you know, is just laughing and laughing? Well, who buys that card? The person who wants the funny card where the snake ate the candy cane. See, and I would skip that. I will post on, I will post on our Instagram the other cards that aren't so offensive that Amanda bought in order. Not to... offensive. I find them offensive. Well, I don't. I don't enjoy. I have to them. find one where it's like I'm Clara and I have to choose between a wooden figure, wooden male figure, or my weird uncle. These. Ugh. This is my lot in life. It's 1800s in Germany, and I'm a girl. Okay, so <laughs> on to brighter things. Katie from Knitwise enjoyed our first. Where few. is Knitwise? Oh, it's, oh, I it's, thought it was a town in like England. No, and it was like, but it's spelt weird. You know how no, the Brits no, are this like. Is the, this is. Did you mean Knitwise? But it's like, <laughs> but it's spelt like K K H L. No, I, oh not, yeah, Knitwise. <laughs> you're just gonna offend all the all the people. Remember that... Remember Bewley? Yes. In the New Forest, and we never, because I was like, you know, Beaulieu, uh, Beaulieu, and they'd be like, do you mean Beaulieu? I, I have a lot of UK listeners they here get it. who's going to be offended by she this. She gets it. She doesn't get it. Look okay. at, look, okay, so Knitwise 09. Knitwise, sure. Knit, it's not Knitwise. <laughs> Knitwise 09 is Katie's uh, Instagram. Look at these great great thing she knits. Oh my gosh, yeah. look at that. Now, she asks... Oh my god, the hungry caterpillar. Oh, yeah, it's, we're are not they making, mittens? We're not making so much fun of it now, are we? Um, I, so, I, would go to a, I would go to a British town where this was all I could buy, this and tarts. That would be amazing. Katie wants to know how we feel about getting and receiving handmade gifts. Oh my god, love them. I know. And, and you can see she makes a lot of handmade things. Yeah, I love them. I'm now going to tell a story that's not as dark or crazy as the one Amanda told. Uh, the story known as The Nutcracker. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's put that one to rest and maybe make this into a ballet. So Amanda and I were in a Christmas show called um, Something the Radio Play. It's a Wonderful Life the Radio um, Play. I thought... I thought you were going to talk about a different show. No. The one that never happened, because that was at Christmas time, too. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll save we that. We should talk about that. We'll save that another time. That we don't, was... 
the Nutcracker took up more than half our episode, so wow. I kind of have to make this one quick for Katie. Okay. And Katie's not going to be happy because you already made fun of her Instagram name. No, I didn't. It's called. You said Knitwise. no. I didn't. I didn't make fun of her Instagram name. <laughs> for the record, you said she's from here. You always like so and so from Michigan. Oh, I see. So and so from oh, here. So you thought so I was she saying she said she's from Knitwise. Okay. So I was like, oh, I'd never heard of this town. This must be, I know you have a lot of UK listeners, so I thought this must be a beautiful little town in like Gloucester or something, okay. or Gloucestershire, whatever okay. that's called. Gloucestershire. I don't care. Worcestershire. So Amanda and I were in this show <laughs> based on the movie It's a Wonderful Life. And it was a radio play, but done on stage. And so we were making a lot of the Foley sounds, so all the sounds of like yeah. wind blowing or or people stomping in the snow or going upstairs, we would do them while other actors were in front of microphones recounting the tale. So it would go in and out of a radio play and the actual film version, let's say. It was so fun. I love doing that play. It was wonderful. And I'm not describing it great, but it was a great experience. It's called It's a Wonderful Life, the radio play is what it's called. And it's it's really well. It's done all over the world, or at least in North America. And we did it in British Columbia in Prince George. And it was everything about it was glorious mm-hmm. so our um our set designer who was also our yes. um uh karen anderson was also our she, she was doing lighting was or, she or asm no yeah she was she was running a board from on stage karen or, anderson or was she actually running a board from on stage i think she was because yeah, everything was, a, was like show the audience the mechanics behind yeah. the radio of the 1940s i can't express how much Karen Anderson does and did on that show, but does in real life, like handmade things. And she's a expert, uh, I think it's called an expert carpenter. She is. Yeah, but it's called something. She's like... Head carpenter. No, but she's also like, she's got like a black belt in carpentry. Like she's got the highest degree of carpentry. She's a wonderful woman, yeah. So amongst all her other talents is during the show, she would have lighting cues and things to do on stage. But when she didn't and the she, show was just going. She wasn't running the show, though, from there, was she? Like she wasn't running the board, was she? She was doing something. I think oh, she, she was running been. the board. OK, well, yeah. she was definitely doing something. She built the set. She was running the board. Hmm. And in order to look like she's doing something that was appropriate for the time period, she was knitting. Mm hmm. And she was knitting these cool pair of fingerless gloves, which Katie on her website also has a pair of fingerless gloves. Amazing. And they looked kind of like a sock, like a like a monkey sock or whatever you call that, where it's gray, white, and red. I don't know how yeah, to describe it. Yeah, what is that called? See, I think of it as Roots. To me, yeah. I think of it as a root sock. Roots I, is a, is roots a company. Makes ones yeah, like Roots that. is, I don't a, think it's, is a clothing them. store here in North America yeah, for anyone yeah. who doesn't have access to a root store. Anyways, those classic gray socks with a little red trim is what it kind of mimicked. And she was doing them like, oh, they look so great. Karen, they look so awesome. You're doing such a great job. And, you know, we did the show for two or three weeks and she was just making them and she completed a glove. And I was like, it's great. And she's like, try it on, see how it looks. I'm like, oh, it looks so fantastic. She goes, oh, thank you. And so I was like, I was admiring these gloves throughout our whole production. She's like, I'm making them for a friend or whatever. She's making it Mm -hmm. for a cousin or something, she had said. And then we came home back to Toronto uh, about five days before Christmas. And on Christmas, I opened my gift, and Amanda had asked Karen to make those gloves, and they were the gloves that Karen had made that I had seen for the three-week run on stage, her making, and I had them. And it was one of the most wonderful gifts, Katie, I've ever received. It was a handmade gift that I saw in the process of being made that Amanda commissioned this black belt in carpentry among Amongst other things, Karen Anderson, who we love and we send a shout out to, made for me. Amazing. Do you want to hear my favorite? Or yeah, sure. Do we have time? We don't, but let's go for it. I would just say my mother has taken up watercolors in her watercoloring in her retirement. So she loves to send beautiful watercolor paintings of scenes from Florida where they live. So rosate spoonbills um, right, that's are a, a bird. bird. Yep. Uh, bird of Paradise Flowers, which, which is, is a, a flower. flower, not a bird, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So I, I really treasure those. When she someone else made you a painting once too, uh, you have made me many paintings. Should I, do I have time to tell that story? Quickly, yes. do I really? Yeah, you, you don't have Nutcracker time to tell it. <laughs> well, just like the Nutcracker uh, in New York is uh, the MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, and one year Marco and I and our two good friends. 
decided to go to New York, I think just for fun. And uh, Those two good friends you'll hear on upcoming episodes, Dale and Trevor. Mm-hmm. And so we went to the Museum of Modern Art, and they have uh, Van Gogh's Starry, Starry Night, or just Starry Night, I believe it's called. The song is Starry, Starry Night. And uh, There's a song? Yeah, uh, by uh, Don McLean. Oh, okay. Famous song about Vincent Van Gogh. Anyway, um, so we were looking at it, and of course it's one of the more popular paintings at that museum, so it has a, it draws a big crowd. So we were looking at it. Everyone's very serious, very reverent, very you know, into it. And my, Marco, and we had just started dating at the time, leans over to me, whispers in my ear, the original title of this painting was Swirlathon. And I started laughing and I couldn't stop laughing. Very loudly in a museum. It was just in such a like serious moment. Anyway, uh, and so he one year painted me Swirlathon. I did a forgery, if you will. I <laughs> painted, I painted, I recreated uh, Van Gogh's yeah. uh, Starry Night. Where is it? I'll take a picture and I I'll put it on I don't know where there. it is. Oh. It lives in this house somewhere. Yeah, it does. In one of the cabinets. I think it's hanging. I think you hanged it. Hung it? Hung it? Hanged it. Hanged it? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Uh, so I like both we giving need to put up some paintings. and receiving handmade gifts. And I make a lot of handmade gifts that I give you. Like I do a lot of like. You're very artistic. Yeah. Much more than me. So do you like giving and receiving handmade gifts? I would love to give a handmade gift, but I have no hands-on talent. If I ever took up pottery, I think that would be it. Everybody would get warped bowls and candlesticks from me, but... Um, Those are very popular. Maybe you could make a warped um, some nutcracker. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, I do love receiving handmade gifts. I'm, I'm very for that. Very for that. Those are some of my favorite. I think the thing is, though, sometimes we think, I will say this, handmade gifts, you know, oh, you can't afford to give me anything. Make me something. But time is also very valuable. So in some ways, to me, like I used to say to Becky, my sister... Just make me a scarf. And she'd be like, I don't have the time to make you a scarf. And I will say this, and I bet Katie from Knitwise09 will agree. Handmade gifts, handmade gifts can actually cost more than purchasing. You can get an inexpensive scarf, Mm -hmm. not as nice, probably not as warm. But the wool, the cost of wool to make or to crochet or knit a, a scarf or gloves or whatnot surpasses the price that, of them being mass produced. Mm-hmm. That said, you cannot compare the quality, the feel, the touch, the softness. The love and the time that yeah. somebody put into it. In of a handmade course. gift. Yeah. So to all you hand makers out there, I don't know if that's a right expression, but sure. all, everyone who makes handmade gifts, I wish you all the best for the holidays. And for all the work you do, I see and I love it. And uh, let us know what you think of, of this episode, I guess. A word of it. <laughs> this, this episode of the Nutcracker meets Handmade Gifts. Um, <laughs> you say Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to our holiday episodes. Of course, we'd appreciate it if you shared them with your friends and family so that they can get maybe a laugh out of it. And until tomorrow, we hope you were able to... Listen and sleep. And enjoy. Just like Clara on Christmas night. Did she end up sleeping in that story? Well, in Balanchine's version, she did. Okay, we hope you sleep like she did in Balanchine's (laughs) version. We hope your Balanchine's version is a good, restful one. All right, until tomorrow, we'll see you.